Welcome to Uncovered. It's Wednesday. I'm Anthony Davis. He's Ron Filipkowski. And together we uncover the MAGA propaganda that is not covered by the mainstream media. Um, Ron, I should say a happy Easter to you. Of course, we're, we're you know, a couple of days behind now, but I trust yours was good. And, uh, you know, you in, enjoyed everything that went with that, if indeed you celebrated. And then the same is extended to those watching the show. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how the MAGA Republicans framed Easter uh, in, in just a little bit, because uh, that was certainly very entertaining. Um, but let's start by talking about Donald Trump. He's you know, been increasingly um, unhinged. And as we say, you know, he's on the ropes. He knows that these legal cases are not going his way at the moment. So he's becoming increasingly agitated and it comes out in the weirdest ways. I want to start, though, with this um, uh, this speech where he claimed that he'd spoken to the family of Ruby Garcia and, and what they supposedly told him. Just set this up before I show the video. We've been able to sort of unwind this whole trail of how this happened. So he, he, Trump, what he's, his campaign is doing right now is every day they are searching for a really bad migrant crime, you know, a crime committed by a migrant. And then they're going to that scene as they did in Georgia with Lake and Riley. Um, these aren't pre, these aren't pre-planned events. They're, he's throwing these rallies together at the last minute right after these crimes occur. And so what happened in, in Michigan was this crime occurred. There were two migrants. The victim was a migrant. The perpetrator was a migrant. They were boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, Ruby Garcia. So this happens, and the Trump campaign immediately schedules an event and um, it's in front of a small law enforcement group of group of like 10,000 officers that are going to endorse him. So so he decides to couple the two together. What happens is this campaign, we now know, reached out to her family, just as he tried to do with the Lake and Riley family and tried to get them to attend the speech so he could pose with them and smile and do his thumbs up and exploit them like he did Lake and Riley. And they refused to go. They wanted no part of it. Um, they they are, they don't like Donald Trump. That's pretty obvious. And they didn't want to go. And they were a grieving family. Uh, so they didn't want to be exploited. So what does Trump then do? He gets up and he gives a speech and he holds up her picture. And he says that he spoke to the family and they told him these wonderful things about her, which we now know he read in the New York Post from her obituary. The comments that he made that he claims her family told him were in her obituary word for word. So he completely made it up. Then her family went on local TV after his speech last night and said that he's lying, that he never spoke to them, that he fabricated this entire thing. So this is just like the last time he went to Michigan and staged a fake union rally where he had a bunch of non-union people holding up union signs, he did it again. It's just another complete hoax and exploitation by Trump. Here's the clip. Ruby's loved ones and community are left grieving for this incredible young woman, remembering what they called her. They said she had just this most contagious laughter, and when she walked into a room, she lit up that room. And I've heard that from so many people. I spoke to some of her family. He did not speak with any of us, so it was um, kind of shocking seeing that he had said that he had spoke with us and, you know, um, saying, well, misinforming people um, live TV. Shocking. You know, I kind of stopped watching it. I, don't, I only seen up to that uh, after I heard, um, you know, a couple of um, misinformation that he had said, I kind of just stopped. I mean, she's being kind about him, isn't she? I mean, at the end of the day, he is a piece of shit. And the way that he uses people, invariably migrants, black or brown people especially, because he doesn't care about any kind of retribution. He doesn't care about a paper trail. He cares nothing for these people. As far as he's concerned, they, they are animals, as he has used that language previously. And so he thinks he can make stuff up and say anything. But that fake compassion where he's, you know, trying to do this 
it's just it makes me so sad because these are people's lives there's a whole grieving family and yet there is no interest in actually doing any good in this moment which he could do if he wanted to but he doesn't bother ruby garcia's family is all migrants they're migrant they're not u.s citizens trump has said he wants to round them up and deport them yeah so on the one hand trump wants them to come to his rally so he can pose with them for pictures and use them as part of his campaign while at the same time saying he wants to put them on a plane and and deport them out of the country. So does he want to deport them after he uses and abuses them or before? You know, this this shows the disgusting shamelessness of this man. And and it exposes when he is doing things like this, the hypocrisy as you've just described of his of his policies on immigration and then, you know, picking somebody just because it's a story and setting up a quick event so that he can exploit that. That is not going to play well with his voters in the long run because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that in one on one hand, all migrants are rapists and drug dealers and they're bringing fentanyl and they're coming across the border and they're going to attack you. And then on the other hand, mm, yes, you know, this kind of faux support and, you know, I spoke to the families. I don't know about you, Ron, and I'm sure people watching will feel the same. I can hear the tone change when he lies. So he yes. goes into a different voice. Yep. And in fact, I might play the clip again. Where he says, I on. talked to her family. You could tell yes. he lies. Yes. Yes. And and it's and it's that it's that moment. I'll just play the beginning of the clip. Just listen to where the gear change comes in when yep. he says that I you know I spoke to the family. It, it is this is appalling. Ruby's yeah. loved ones and community are left grieving for this incredible young woman remembering what they called her they said she had just this most contagious laughter and when she walked into a room she lit up that room and i've heard that from so many people i spoke to some of her family i mean right there, yeah. the last the other, part is the lie the last part is the lie and yeah. the other thing we should say is the new york post is he's not a reputable newspaper either when it comes to coverage but it's Trump's favorite paper. He reads it every morning. Yeah. So that's where he got that quote from about he, she lights up a room. That's that's come straight from her obituary, which the Post printed. So, yeah, it's just absolutely it's absolutely appalling. You know what he's what he's doing to the, and, and there'll be more. You know there'll be another yeah. one next week. Next week someone will get killed somewhere. You know whether it's Idaho or Arizona or somewhere. And three days later he'll be there trying to exploit it. Uh, on this very same subject, let's talk about this rally where Trump got the, the January 6 hostages, as he calls them, singing from prison. But there is a twist to this story, isn't there? Just just tell us what happened. Well, you are you talking about the, law, the officer's funeral in New York City? Correct. Yeah. So again, you know, officers get, I, I checked this morning, actually, uh, officers get killed in the line of duty almost every day in this country, usually yeah. about two or three a week. And in the last three days, there was three more. One of them was hit by a car that ran a red light. Another one was shot. Another one was uh, parked in a, off the side of the road and got hit by a tractor trailer that was probably drunk driving. Who knows? So officers get killed all the time. There was at the time he went to this New York City officer's funeral. Eight officers had been shot and killed in the line of duty this year. Trump didn't say anything about any of those deaths. He didn't go to their services. He didn't go to their wakes. He didn't pose for photos with their families. Nothing. But this one happened, and he immediately jumped on a plane and ran up to, un, un, unscheduled, ran up to their service. Why? The reason why he did it is because their memorial service was scheduled the exact same day, right down the street from Joe Biden's big fundraiser that he was doing with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And the Trump campaign saw that as their chance to exploit the optics of Trump cares about this fallen officer and he's busy attending this officer's funeral while Biden is busy hanging out with the big donors and, and doing a fundraiser. It, it was gross. It was cynical. And once again, just like with Lake and Riley, he was backstage with them, you know, with the big smiles and the thumbs up. 
Uh, it was just a disgusting sight. It, it really is sad that these families continue to allow Trump and his campaign to exploit them. And I hope that more families are like the Garcia family who are going to tell him to, you know, take a hike. It's going to keep happening, though, Ron, isn't it? Because, you know, clearly they can't afford rallies anymore. You know, the, the Trump campaign is having to funnel all the money into into legal fees. And, and you know, these rallies are kind of expensive to put on. So I would suggest that we yeah. should expect more of these guerrilla style, uh, yep. you know, doorstepping events that Trump does where, you know, they get some intel that these types of things are happening and he shows up for a photo op in the same way that he lied about going down to ground zero on 9-11 and helping the firefighters. That's right. Let me let me go back to your, your original question because I yep. didn't answer that how it ties into January 6th. Right, was, we have the, we have this clip, yeah. Right, of, of course, you know, he 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 is claiming, you know, that he backs the blue, right? Well, he doesn't back the blue because there were over 150 police officers that were beaten and injured on January 6th. He's never, he never went to the hospital and visited them. He never commended them for their service or praised them for being, for their heroism on that day. Uh, and he has promised to pardon all of the people who beat them. And so after he goes up to exploit these, this one officer's death and claim he backs the blue, Officer Sicknick's brother went on, went on TV and, you know, pointed out that Trump not only has prompt, which I didn't know this, but Trump has not only promised to pardon the people who beat his brother and, and, and caused his brother's death, but... He plays them singing the national anthem from the D.C. jail at every one of his rallies. And his brother, Sicknick's brother, pointed out that the person who was holding up, who answered the phone and was holding up the phone to record them singing the anthem was the same guy who beat up his brother, which ultimately resulted in his death a few days later. Here's the clip. He's now celebrated the events of January 6th. I mean, he's talking about pardoning those who were convicted of crimes uh, related to the January 6th insurrection. He's, he's calling them hostages uh, at, at his rallies. He plays a recording of, of the January 6th defendant singing the Star Spangled Banner. I wonder how you react when you see the president celebrating that day, not, not, not even running away from it, but, but now celebrating it. He, he's disgusting, but I know I'm not gonna change anybody's mind. Uh, by the way, the video that came out along with those people singing the national anthem, the person who picks up the phone in the prison is the very same person who assaulted my brother. Really? That's amazing. The same person. I mean, that's how hard it is for families of, you know, bereaved families who have been affected by Donald Trump's behavior or policies. You know, it, it, it's to lose somebody is one thing, but to lose somebody in the types of circumstances that could have been prevented by the former president of the United States yeah. refusing to call off the riot for hours. I mean, it, it is it is so tragic. And in, in, in that clip, you can really feel his pain. Yep, Trump. I mean, most Republicans, how they handle J6 is to minimize it, to say, mm -hmm. Well, you know, 90 percent of the people were nonviolent. You know, they were just walking around in the Capitol, you know, the old ordinary tourist visit kind of argument. But Trump is not doing that. Trump is saying that this was a great patriotic day. And these are heroes. These are heroes. And none of them should be in jail. None of the other Republicans are going that far. You know, they've cooked up conspiracies and they've minimized it. But Trump is taking it to the next level. He is saying these people should be honored and he does honor them at his rallies. And and I just got to believe I got to believe that the American people ultimately are going to make him pay for this. And, you know, we talk about this all the time, that the voters who decide these elections are are not the political junkies who are necessarily watching the show or on Twitter. They're the people who watch sports and local news and are raising their kids and, and they check in a few months before the election. But that by the going back to that Ruby Garcia story that was played all over local news in a critical swing state of Michigan. And those low information voters who aren't on social media, 
That's the news that they watch. They watch their local news. And what they saw last night was Ruby Garcia's family all over local news in Michigan trashing him. So I just got to believe that when those kind of people check back in and and they, they're unaware that Donald Trump is playing is playing J sixers at his rallies. They're unaware that he's promised to pardon him, but when they become aware of it, I think they're going to recoil. I agree. The other thing is that Donald Trump doesn't really care about the January sixes, but he does care about no. criticizing the judiciary because it's him who's currently in the, in the legal system, uh, gag orders and everything else. And so anything that he can say that, that, that criticizes the judiciary, for their decision over these January 6 participants or anything, just in his mind probably supports his case that it's all a witch hunt. You know how this is a ploy that he doesn't care about J6ers like you said, was for two years he did absolutely nothing. Right, until, he didn't until talk it was about election them. time. They were all, all of their families were begging, begging Donald Trump to do fundraisers to help them get attorneys uh, to help with their commissary, you know, their money for extra food and stuff in there, begging him to do something. He did absolutely nothing for them for two years, didn't lift a finger. He's only started talking about them and elevating them about a year ago. So, and and that's because he's he's trying to use them to rally his base for this campaign. Yeah. So, He's he's done nothing for J Sixers. He doesn't really care about any of those people. He thinks that they're pawn scum. But what he's doing right now by praising them and elevating him is to try and rally his base around him for this election. And it is literally just it's going to be as we get to the election. It's just going to be his base that support him because I can right. feel people hemorrhaging away from that guy because the more contradictions that we hear in you know various news outlets or on social media about things that he's said or in this case as we've discussed where he's you know pretending to support somebody he doesn't really care about that there's going to be so many of these events and these incidents that come November people are going to be like who is this guy like he's it's 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 disingenuous and yet we mentioned and we should go back and, and discuss very quickly this fundraiser that Biden did with Obama and with Clinton. I mean, it was a beautiful sight to see. They 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 appeared. Was it at Radio City Music Hall? I, it was. I forget. Right. Yep. So they they came up on that kind of that that rising stage. The three of them together. It was a, it was a a beautiful moment of unity, and. You know, I think, you know, we don't really give them the credit that they deserve. But those three presidents together are quite a force to be to be reckoned with, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, you're right. It shows the unity of the Democratic Party past and present and contrast that with Trump, where not one former Republican president or vice president or even nominee for president, <laughs> yeah. including his own, anything is to supporting do him. him. Yeah. Not Romney, not, well, obviously not McCain, but not uh, Bush, Pence. not Pence, not uh, Cheney. None of them are yeah. supporting him. Not one. And you contrast that with Biden, who has the support of every prominent Democrat. So, yes, that is going to benefit us greatly. And so when Trump was trying to highlight this fundraiser by 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 trying to divert attention and being all touchy feely, the reality is that his own personal lawyer, Alina Harbour, was celebrating her 40th birthday party at Mar-a-Lago, spending campaign dollars and and celebrating in the most lavish of ways. And really, it's important for us to highlight how they are spending money that is being donated to Trump's campaign. Alina Haba has many new friends, as we know. She's from New Jersey, um, but she appears to have decamped to Mar-a-Lago, where she pretty much spends all her time these days. And all of her new friends that she hangs out with are all the people who hang out at Mar-a-Lago and are members there. And so what did she do for her 40th birthday party after siphoning millions of dollars from the Trump pack from Trump donors? 
in legal fees for herself to lose cases. She flew all of those new ritzy friends that she has made at Mar-a-Lago to St. Bart's, which is probably the most expensive place you right. can go in the Caribbean, I think. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been there, but that's what I have heard. And um, flew all of her friends there for this lavish multi-day celebration. I think it was four or five days. She gave them expensive handbags and gifts. And, and yes, all of this paid for by your Donald J. Trump donations that grandma and grandpa are sending in. Let's, let's take a look at them uh, enjoying themselves on their, on their donor's dime. I mean, I've never really seen anything like that before. I was looking because, you know, he, Trump threw a party for her at Mar-a-Lago as well. And I was That's looking right. at... Right, and I was looking at pictures of that, and there was pictures of Kimberly Guifoyle and Lara Trump with Alina Harbour all, like, hunched around and, you know, posing, and everybody dressed up to the nines and celebrating, and, and it didn't look like they cared much for American politics in those moments. You know, they were, they were really going for it. But what I thought was most interesting, and I wish I had the picture here to show, but I put it, I put it on, my, on my Twitter, and that was that if you look at the picture of the three of them together on Lara Trump's uh, Instagram, it was n it was not photoshopped. <laughs> but, but when you looked at the picture of the same picture of them on Kimberly Guifoyle's Instagram, she had a completely new face, Ron. Yeah. Completely yeah. new. I mean, when are they getting well, the time it's... to photoshop these things? Yeah, you're you're right though about the party. I think the St. Bart's thing was like five or six days in St. Bart's. Yeah, which was like pre-birthday. And right. then they all flew back to Mar-a-Lago for the actual birthday party on her birthday, uh, which they had a big bash there, too. So, yes, it's it's just an, a never-ending party for Alina Haba, Laura Trump, Kim Guilfoyle, and friends on Mr. and Mrs. MAGA from Topeka, Kansas, dime. And, and again, all of this will eventually kind of come through and, and chip away at, at, at the Trump vote. And, and I think that's what they fail to recognize is that they're having, you know, they're, they're just, for them, you see, these people are so wealthy. This is the thing I think people forget. These people are so wealthy. They, they really have no interest in the types of people that are supporting them. You know, never the twain shall meet. And, and the only time they're in the same room is at a, a rally or an event when there's... I mean, even at Alina Harbour's um, birthday party in the ballroom, I don't know whether it was her birthday party or maybe it was the Easter lunch that you were invited to, like members were invited to. There was a whole kind of roped-off section in the middle where the Trump family was sitting. That seated. was Easter. That yeah. was Easter, right? So yeah. even though yeah. people were paying to go to lunch with Trump, it, it was it was still like you sit in that section and he'll be over in that section. Yeah, you can stand there and cheer him when he walks in the room. Right. <laughs> you know, which is the other bizarre thing. I notice people are commenting on this a lot more. We've talked about it on the show that, yeah. you know, he makes this grant every time he comes in. It's this grand entrance where they're all behind the ropes. And, you know, when he walks in for dinner every night, they all stand up and they cheer and then he might come and touch a couple of them and and uh that that's that's what he's dreamed since he was a little kid is that every time he walks into a room everyone in the room stands up stops what they're doing and cheers him this is what he's dreamed about since he was six years old and he's it's, finally created this world yeah i mean he would be so happy just continuing his life out in mar-a-lago as an ex-president pretending to be the president have everyone calling him mr president and and just you know playing the role because that's how i saw his presidency it was that it was a it was a reality show where he played the role of the president and but what he didn't realize is that he was literally crashing world markets by his decision making and making life hell for minority groups and immigrants and 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 lgbtq people like and also climate change of course and so Really? And also the free right to protest. Oh, sorry, there's a whole bunch of things I'm remembering now from his presidency. But, it, it, you know, he has no idea about the car crashes going on in the background as he keeps walking forward. It's just chaos. 
behind not to mention what he did to us during covid you know where a lot of these old covid clips are now being posted right on the fourth anniversary of them and you know it's sort of like reliving this nightmare for all of us where he's just was spouting all these insane conspiracy theories bragging about his ratings at his press conference yes saying he was number one on facebook in the middle of it yeah i'm number one on facebook my ratings are higher yeah you know it's it's like I can vividly recall that day I was talking to to the to Brett and Ben about this, you know, just screaming at the television, throwing things at the television, saying, we're out of work. We're dying. We yeah. want medical information. I don't care what your ratings are, you know? And, and meanwhile, 1.2 million Americans died. And the statisticians say that at least 600,000 of those lives could have been saved if Trump had got things together from the very beginning. And, and, and that's the reality is, again, it's not just the, the people that, who are deceased, but it is the families of the deceased who then have to look at these clips of Trump saying, no, I take no responsibility at all. And maybe we could shine a light inside the body somehow and, and kill it that way. You know, th- these clips could be amusing to you and I. But to people who have lost someone in those early stages of the pandemic when he was talking about bleach and everything else, they will forever be a very difficult thing to see or to hear about because of the, of, of the cost to their, to their families. And, and, we, and should, we shouldn't forget that. I think we need to remind them constantly. And, yeah. and that's what we're trying to do on social media. A lot of us is replay some of these old clips on the four-year anniversary. And, and because even I, as as much as I was following it and as furious as I was, I still forgot a lot of this stuff, Yeah, you know, and when these old clips get dredged back up, it brings those memories back. And I I think it's important to remind, because, because a lot of voters voted against Trump in 2020, simply purely because of the way he handled COVID. And we have to remind them about that. Yeah. And of course, you know, the, the, the economy under Donald Trump and, and also immigration, which you and I talk about a lot, you know, more immigrants were were coming to the border and were uh, and were allowed to settle in the U.S. under Donald Trump, and and Joe Biden's record on immigration is much more hardline comparatively to 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 Trump's, and yet that story is not being told properly. You know, and I, I feel like we need to keep reminding people. I mean, even. You know, they always use energy independence as an argument, don't they? I mean, we've we've got more oil now. You know, more drilling has gone on under under Joe Biden. I'm not happy about it, but I recognise that. You know, if if you're going to drill for it and it's there is a political advantage to that, use it, talk about it, take advantage of it, because the fight between now and November is not about Joe Biden. It's about not Donald Trump. And, and, you know, that is really, you have to throw everything you can at this. And I, I still feel like the Biden campaign is, is, is still pretty tempered. But, you know, we are still a few months out, right? Well, I'm guessing August, September time, they might really open the taps. I still get the sense to some degree that they're a little afraid of their base on some of these things like right. that and like immigration. And they're afraid. And obviously, we've seen that with Gaza, you know, in Israel, that yes. uh, they're they're trying to navigate their way through that, where they obviously disagree with what Netanyahu is doing. Uh, but they're trying to support Israel without to try not to lose Jewish support. But at the same time, they recognize that their base is getting furious with good reason in, in a lot of situations. So, so yes, there's this push pull, but, but I think that what's going to happen is as they get closer to election, they're going to not worry so much about the base's feelings and just assume they're going to be with us, hope they're going to be with us with the specter of Trump. And they're just going to make that hard play for the center. I, I would just say something. I just want to say something about Israel because it's not a topic we talk about that much because it's, it's still playing out in real Thank God. time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the point that I make, which is something that you just said that was interesting about not wanting to lose the Jewish support. Let's yeah. be clear just for a second that that, you know, not all Israelis are Jews. Right. Right. And and, and the support is not about supporting Israel or supporting Jews. It's it's Netanyahu. And Netanyahu does not represent all of the people of Israel. And there are so many people in Israel that want Netanyahu gone. And Netanyahu, who is the one who is instigating all of these all of these attacks, 
in response to that terrorist that terrorism event he ultimately is a donald trump character he is That's under right. investigation he does not want to lose his job as, as, as a prime minister so he is holding on to it uh, you know like desperately because he knows that corruption charges are awaiting him if he does. And that's the tragedy of that story right now. It is. It, and, and, it's the worst so case scenario for Biden. It, it is. To, for this attack to happen with somebody like Netanyahu as prime minister. Because exactly. if he, if it was somebody else, this war would not be being prosecuted this way. Of, of course yeah. not. I mean, there would have been a two-state solution discussed and the international community involved. And, you know, everybody would have felt like they'd done their best you know, put their best foot forward. But Netanyahu is the one who is blocking time and time again. And and so it's not as simple as being like, you know, Biden wants the support of the Jews, because, you know, this is not about it's not really about the Jews. This is about, you know, again, one authoritarian character, far right authoritarian character who who is mistreating not just the people of, of um, you know, the Palestinian people, the people of Gaza, but his own people too, in this. Um, so I just thought I'd kind of point that out as an aside. Talking of the religious, let's talk about how MAGA handled Easter, because, of course, this is something that they always trying to manipulate the language. Right. Um, and claiming that Joe Biden, you know, like the, Trump used to do this about Christmas. I'm bringing I'm bringing Merry Christmas back and all that stuff. I mean, let's just take a little look at how Fox handled this story. If you were concerned with the waning of religion in America, I mean, here's your example, Mark. Yeah, for, for years we've been having a campaign to put Christ back into Christmas. Apparently under Joe Biden, we've got to put Christ back into Easter, too. Yeah, hey, the other thing that happened yesterday, and I thought this was even uh, just a, quite a stunning point of view. This it doesn't make any sense, Ron. That's why he's doing that awkward face at the end, because they literally don't have a story here. You know, Joe Biden is a Catholic. He was at church on Easter. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's Easter message was just a happy Easter and a whole page barrage full of criticism of the judiciary. I mean, even Daily Caller, yeah. which was founded by Tucker Carlson and is currently being run by Ben Shapiro, retracted their story about this hoax that they bought into. But for Fox, this is great content, you know, Easter, sacrilegion. And, and it also proves that I feel like I can never sleep because, you know, every time I step away from social media, there's like a new hoax that has to be debunked. And I feel like I feel like I'm one of the people that has to be upfront in doing that, uh, along with some others. But the reason why I say that is I was at a local Democratic event for local candidates in this area and i was the guest speaker there so i was there for three hours because a lot of them wanted to talk to me after and and all that so i hung around for a while so i was offline for three hours which for me is basically an eternity that's a fight so, worse than death that is i get to my car i open the phone and just every right winger on social media is tweeting you know biden has declared easter transgender day you know, and, and it's just was all a hoax. This this was the same policy that has been in effect for March 31st commemorate since 2009. Then they started the Easter egg hoax, you know, which is Biden is not allowing any religious symbols on the Easter eggs at the White House, which has been the policy of the White House for 30 years. This is not coming from Biden. These were policies that were in existence long before Biden that they claimed Biden is the one who did this and he's canceling Christians. He's attacking Christians. It was all just a ridiculous hoax. And you have to ask yourself, obviously this stirs up their base and gets them clicks and ratings, but you know, does any of this filter out to the average swing voter? I doubt it, but who knows? And you know, this is the other thing that is, 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 it frustrates me so much is that the transgender conversation that the that the right are having is not just so completely offensive and inaccurate, but you know, using this opportunity where we should be celebrating trans people to to criticize them even more um, is so it's so completely offensive. I, I think I put out a tweet that said, 
something like um, for all of those who are denying the existence of trans people or criticizing them, you're too late. They already exist. There's 2.6 million of them in the United States who were born trans. And I think we need to start using that language of being born trans, because again, this is something that they just refuse to understand. They think it's a, an identity that you just kind of take on in middle age where you're thinking, oh, actually, I'll think I'll identify as trans. It's like, are you kidding me? And I, I wish there was more pushback on, on that subject. Yeah, I, they you know, think I, it's like changing your socks, right. you know, changing your gender. It's just something you, you wake up one day on a whim and decide to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with trans people, so this is why I'm, I feel so passionately about it. And I recognize that to be trans is really difficult. It is not an easy life. You know, no matter what society you live in, people are always judging you. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, especially in the United States when access to health care. I mean, there's people walking around with genitals that they don't want, that they can't afford to have changed. You understand? It's like it is a really hard life. And I think that you know, the, the, what I saw that day really compounded and really reminded me of how much more work there is to do on that subject. What, um, what Republicans love to do, and we've seen this with Trump mocking people's disabilities, is they love to hone in on vulnerable people, uh, small uh, group segments of people, and make fun of them and ridicule them and demonize them yeah. and, so they can all get a laugh that's that's what they do and they do it every day constantly and this small percentage of trans people who have a very difficult life as you said in in any society including this one uh they they just are making it worse for them um let's talk about don jr he's uh taken a position on uh the department of justice and and catholicism let's take a look at him and try and I'd love to know what he's been smoking. I mean, this is so interesting. Biden's DOJ treated Catholics like terrorists. If you were a practicing Catholic, you were a domestic terrorist. If you bought a Bible, you were marked by your banks, and that information was given to said FBI and DOJ. They think church-going patriots are terrorists. They're just bonkers. I mean, the whole family is bonkers, Ron. People must be starting to realize that, it, you know, even just to behave like this and to use that kind of, you know, that pentameter, that kind of delivery is not conducive to, you know, any kind of intelligent discourse. I mean, what they do is they'll take some one particular instance of something happening and they will just spin it and spin it and spin it out of control until it takes on a life of its own and just becomes this mythology. So what he's the core incident that he's talking about are people who protest outside abortion clinics. That's yeah. what he's referring to when he says Catholics. Okay, this there was a group of of cap and, and how what they say is they're only out there praying and they got arrested by the Biden administration. That's not what they're doing. They're they're blocking entrances, they're harassing people and there's specific laws that say you can't do that at healthcare clinics that's what these people do they're or, they're organized they're orchestrated and it's illegal and they get arrested and so what that becomes for republicans is they're targeting catholics they're not targeting catholics they're targeting a small group of people a a handful three or four who are blocking access and threatening and harassing women trying to get health care okay how would they feel if they were standing outside vasectomy clinics yelling at men what are you doing and going in there what are you, you know screaming and yelling at them this is what's happening but they but they make this like because of that because the biden the doj and the fbi are enforcing those laws that the biden administration has declared war on catholics declared war on christianity the thing about Bibles being reported, the FBI, again, that's just some internet conspiracy that just never happened, that he's just completely making up. So I think it's important, and that's why I watch these crazy podcasts. This is the son of the Republican nominee for president, who is a prominent, plays a prominent role in, in the campaign in this movement. So the more we can put things out there like this to discredit these people, the better. And by the way, follow that up with the past president of Fox News, 
said he was an absolute idiot and moron, and he just says stupid things to try and please his father, who really barely even notices him. I mean, that's the tragic part of the story, isn't it? That, you know, Trump obviously was trying to get the attention of his own father, uh, Fred Trump. And then now, of course, because no one no one went to therapy and dealt with any of this, any of this, uh, uh, this historic trauma, that now Trump's own children are trying to get their the attention and, and, and support of, of their father, too. Uh, I feel sorry for Barron. That's all I can say. I mean, you know, he's at the, he's at, he's at the end of, of this family tree. Let's um, talk about Florida. Uh, some good news out of Florida, thanks to the Supreme Court there that is actually putting abortion as well as uh, legalizing marijuana on the on the ticket. Tell us about this. Well, this is this is really huge because Florida's new law just went into effect Uh basically what what it was was they they had the uh, six week abortion ban which a six week abortion ban plus what you have to do to jump through hoops to get exceptions approved etc basically means florida now has a total abortion ban um and florida has become a sanctuary state for abortion in the south it's it, it has been over the last year since roe was overturned the only southern state where you could easily and safely get an abortion through 15 weeks. But now that door is closed. Now there are no Southern states where that can happen as of this week. So women, especially in Florida, are infuriated by this decision. So what the Supreme Court did is they upheld that law, which is now in effect, but they allowed the ballot referendum, the referendum would go on a ballot, which for November where women can get those rights back and and return it back to a row standard. And they added to that, they also approved the ballot language for the marijuana initiative, which we have medical marijuana in Florida, but it's very expensive. They make you renew your card every six months, go to a doctor. It, it's it, it's very ex- expensive for to have a medical marijuana prescription in Florida. So what you're going to have this November in Florida, even though the Republicans have a decided advantage over the last few years here in what used to be a swing state, is you're going to have all these new people who have never voted before, especially young people. You're going to have a bunch of people who are going to show up to vote for legalization of marijuana who have never voted before. And these people are not showing up in polls because no pollsters call these people because they've never voted. And you're going to have a lot of women show up to vote who have never voted before. And nobody knows because no polls are going to make these people show up. Nobody knows what's that, what that's going to do in the presidential race, in Rick Scott's Senate race, and in the congressional races. It's a total wild card. At the very least, it's going to make Trump spend money in Florida that he doesn't have just to make sure, because if Trump loses Florida, it's all over. The election's over. He can't win. He, he absolutely has to win Florida. And by the way, Democrats, have re- the National Democratic Party responded by saying they're going to open up field offices in Florida and they're now going to spend money in Florida, which is which is I know the Florida Democrats are very excited about that because the National Democratic Party and the Biden campaign pretty much abandoned Florida in 2020 and wrote it off. They're saying they're not going to do that this time. So we'll see. It would hurt Trump a lot, wouldn't it? Because, you know, he he relocated from New York to Florida, took his vote with him. And yet, you know, he feels like he's the king of of Florida, doesn't he? He has that that sense of it's not just West Palm Beach. I mean, he really feels like that's his state. And so many Republicans supposedly are relocating from California to Florida, similar climate, but being around uh, more politically like-minded people. It'd be very interesting if Florida was to flip. It would really change the entire narrative when people talk about Republican and Democrat states. And let's not forget, he spent the last two years trashing DeSantis, Florida's governor, yeah. who has a lot of support among Republicans here in Florida still. And so how is that going to affect the race? DeSantis is not going to campaign for him or help him in any way. He's only he gave a a sort of backhanded endorsement. And DeSantis hasn't said a word about Trump since and vice versa. So, look, it's still 
a long shot, you know, for Biden to win Florida. But if they do invest some extra resources here while Trump tries to avoid spending any money here, um, stranger things have happened. They could pull the upset. Yeah, we shouldn't underestimate quite how, you know, polling really is, is so ineffectual. And I think this time more than ever, yes. because there is so much more at stake now with Roe being overturned, with Trump and his legal cases. We're in a completely different political landscape than we were in 2020. And and I get a sense that provided that the Democrats don't drop the ball on immigration and are a little bit, have a bit more clarity on immigration because they do have things to celebrate, you know, from the electorate's perspective and on the economy especially because those two things invariably are where Republicans are going to try and you know, hit them where it hurts. I, I predict that after this election, that the polling industry across the board is going to do a big soul searching retrospective because I think they know that they have lost it. They, the methodology that they have used to poll people in the past no longer works in the modern era where people don't have home phones, people don't call screen their cell phones. They don't talk to pollsters. They're increasingly online. And I, their pollsters are having a very difficult time re getting accurate polls because they're not able to reach all of these people. And so this is why I never post any poll results, never have, positive or negative. I don't look at them. I don't read them because I don't believe any of those polls. It's crazy that in this age of information, and data that we aren't able to poll people. I mean, Facebook must have the data on who's going to win the election. Amazon must have can. data on who's going to win the election. It must be part of their algorithm. I think there's a way to do it, but it's very, very expensive. I've talked to some old school pollsters. They, they have told me that there is a way to do it, but it's extremely expensive to commission an accurate poll that takes a big cross section of people and therefore only only a handful like a senate candidate or a presidential candidate does it and they don't do it very often and they don't share those results with anyone so these media polls that are out there where they're sampling like 800 people they're just absolute garbage to be completely disregarded charlie kirk is doing his best to uh, win the suburban mum vote isn't he and uh going out of his way to uh you know, uh, bring about a, 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 a larger contingent in, in that demographic. Let's have a little listen to him. We have basically told a great generation of young women, don't get married, don't have kids, go get a corporate job. And it's created mass political hysteria. Um, and then in their early 30s, they get really upset because they say, you know, the boys don't want to date me anymore because they're not at their prime. And get, people get mad when I say that. Well, it's just true. If you're in your early 30s, I'm sorry. It's like you're not as attractive in the dating pool as you were in the early 20s. But again, you have your corporate job and cats. So I thought, you, you know. He's no oil painting himself. Uh, what's, what's he doing here? Where, where was this event? Uh, I'm not sure where that event is, but I think it was in Arizona, but I'm not 100% sure. But, uh, you know, Charlie's been saying this stuff for years, largely to his own group of people. And we at Midas and have, have you know, people have largely on the left ignored Charlie Kirk for the most part. But we have made a concerted effort to pay a lot of attention to him this year because he is so intertwined with Republican candidates, Donald Trump, Carrie Lake, so many others, uh, and and uh, the new RNC leadership, Laura, Laura Trump, that if we really felt like if, you know, he says a lot of crazy, nasty stuff, and if we could put some of that stuff out there to the general public, they would really be sickened by this guy. And that's what we've been doing for the last six months or so is putting out a lot of Charlie Kirk stuff. And I can tell you that what has happened is even the MAGA people, even on the right there, he's getting a lot of backlash, a lot. And uh, they're, they're saying, you're embarrassing us, dude. You're hurting us, dude. Shut your mouth. What are you doing? I mean, he came out against birth control this week, birth control. And he's talking about you know, women uh, going downhill after they're 30. <laughs> you know, when he married his wife when she was 32. Uh, so 
I mean, he's made he made statements about Martin Luther King saying he was garbage and Martin Luther King shouldn't have a holiday. So we're going to continue to beat on this Charlie Kirk drum over and over again. As long as Republican candidates continue to wrap their arms around him, embrace him, go to his events, we are going to hang his words on them and make them own what he stands for and what he says. And and what we do is we highlight the facts of what he's actually said. We're not, we're not about changing it or slurring yeah. him or libeling him, just presenting his hypocrisy and making it absolutely crystal clear that stuff that he says doesn't get lost in the noise because he is so offensive. Not to mention that stuff about, you know, black pilots and wanting a white pilot and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's so offensive and so racist and so much of this stuff is misogynistic and racist and there's no there's no way of hiding it you know the 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 GOP hasn't really changed in in that way but it's being delivered in a different way and and he's an example well, of that and, and what he said on his show last week about Midas touch was he said Midas touch is not just going after Trump these guys are going after the whole MAGA movement and he is Absolutely right. I wrote that in an outline three years ago yeah. that uh, my game plan, I don't want to just take out Trump. I want to take on the MAGA influencers that prop up Trump, that raise the money for Trump, that elevate Trump to the grassroots. And Charlie Kirk is a big part of that. There's many others, but discrediting Charlie Kirk is key. Let's talk about Pastor Mark uh, Burns, because he showed up at the uh, Eric Trump and uh, Michael Flynn's event in Idaho recently and was um, certainly very passionate with his language. Let's have a little listen to this guy. I've come in here to declare war on every demonic demon possessed Democrat that comes from the gates of hell. I can't hear nobody, America. Are you standing with me? Say yeah. Are you standing with me? Shout yeah! Are you standing with Donald J. Trump? Shout yeah! Are you ready for him to come back? Evangelical is an understatement <laughs> with this guy. I mean, what's the story here, Ron? One of the biggest differences between the two parties right now and one of the biggest advantages Democrats have is Democratic voters in Democratic primaries are choosing the candidates, right? Biden isn't weighing in on congressional primaries, right, for the most part. And neither is Schumer and neither is Hakeem Jeffries or Pelosi. Here and there, they might pick a, you know, a certain friend that they like that they're going to back, but they're not, they're not across the board putting their thumb on the scale. On the Republican side, Donald Trump is picking all their nominees. And Donald Trump as we've seen in the past, is not very good at evaluating talent and hiring people. And so he continues in race after race to elevate and advance and endorse the worst possible candidates. We saw it with Kerry Lake in the Arizona Senate race. We saw it in Georgia with Purdue and Kelly Loeffler, Dr. O Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, Doug Mastriano in, in Pennsylvania for governor. All of these people had much stronger candidates running against them in the primaries, but Trump put his thumb on the scale and elevated people who are loyal to him, who kiss his ass, who tell him he's great and he's the greatest and wonderful, and who suck up to him. And Trump endorses them for those reasons, not because they're the best candidates or have the best chance to win, but because they're loyal and kiss up to him. So he, out of the blue, endorses this guy, Mark Burns, for Congress in South Carolina. I mean, it's just completely nonsensical that you... And, and when he does that, I'm thinking to myself, I have so much opposition tape on this guy. Yeah, I mean, so much dirt on this guy. But obviously, Trump doesn't, doesn't know about it because we're going to... And the same thing happened with that Mark Robinson guy that he elevated for governor of North Carolina. That guy has so many skeletons in his closet, too. So once again, Trump continues to lose races for the Republican Party by endorsing people like this. And and hopefully it will go the way of the midterms. I mean, as you were naming those candidates that I had 
purposely tried to forget about. So thank you very much for <laughs> reminding us of some of those crackpots that, you know, they now are nowhere to be seen. And, you know, that really is the way that a lot of these people need to go. They're not fit for office. They're not up to standard. And yet Donald Trump's narcissism and his, you know, he, he's he's soul that is if he indeed he has a soul whatever that his emptiness is so desperate for attention and support that yeah he will continue because of his mental pathology to endorse completely unsuitable candidates good is all i say keep you know, going mr t if if we said to any republican political consultant back in 2016 that in 2024 the democrats were going to own both senate seats in Georgia, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, they would have said that's not possible. But but it was made possible by Donald Trump. Who now is selling Bibles? We should probably touch on this because the Bible sales thing has actually backfired in, in several ways, hasn't it? Partly because it's such a terrible product, not, not the Bible itself, but this actually, the actual the way that this product is produced. We touched on it a little bit last week. Just tell us, um, just talk to us a little bit about this story. You know, once again, this is a, a situation where it's just the greed of Donald Trump trumps everything else. It, it, it takes precedence over everything else. There's no way anybody with his camp, there's this disconnect between Trump the businessman grifter and Trump the candidate. And so under normal circumstances, a candidate for president would go to his campaign team and say, look, I'm thinking about doing this business deal. What do you think? And they would say, that's ridiculous. Don't do that. This is going to hurt you, right? Yeah. Like whether it's the digital trading cards or sneakers or anything else. But Donald Trump doesn't do that. He doesn't listen to those people he just went, goes off and does these things on his own and they have to clean up the mess and, and deal with the fallout. And, and this has happened time and time again with these grifts. So when he comes out with this Bible thing, you know, this was, I think, even worse than than the sneakers and the NFT because... Well, it's blasphemous. It's, That's it's why. It's blasphemous. It's blasphemous. You know what I heard from some evangelicals, even Republican evangelicals, what bothered them about this yeah. was... He added the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and, um, you know, some of the, the Pledge of Allegiance yes. and, and this stuff to the Bible. And even Republican evangelicals were upset about that because you don't mess with the Bible. You don't add to it. You don't add political documents to it. And that's what they've done with this Bible. Yeah, it is. It's it's the coming together of church and state, right? That's it. That's how they should have advertised it. Here's uh, here's uh, Lee Gre Lee Greenwood. They only are condemning uh, me and the president Donald Trump for uh, for broadcasting faith through advertising a Bible. I have my Bible right here that President Trump signed to me. By the way. It's like great evidence for me that the president is a Christian. And, and I'll tell you, even the people on the left, go to church, celebrate Easter this week. Well, I, I'm not a Christian, but I'll sign your Bible if, <laughs> if you want me to, Ron. I mean, come on, this is, this is so obvious that it's a grift. And, and Fox viewers or whichever channel that was should must realize that. Here's the thing. Trump couldn't get, and Fox News and Newsmax couldn't get anyone to defend Trump on this. <laughs> they couldn't right. get any senators, <laughs> any congressmen, any yeah. nobody wanted to go on TV to defend Trump's Bible sales. So they're stuck with Lee Greenwood, who's his business partner on this deal. And what is what is Lee Greenwood? What is his pitch? Right? What? How is he defending this? But he's, you know, first of all, he's saying, well, this is just going to help put the Bible in more people's hands, and they'll get the word. Okay, for sixty bucks. But, you know, what did he just say there? It proved to him that Trump is a true Christian because what he said is he mailed one of these Bibles to Trump and Trump autographed it and mailed it back to him. Beautiful. That proves to Lee Greenwood that Trump is a true Christian. And by the way, Lee, Lee Greenwood has been married four times. Trump has been married three times. <laughs> Not that that necessarily is any proof of what's one way or the other, but it's interesting that the two Bible sales partners have seven wives between them. <laughs> Let's um, just talk very quickly about the uh, share price of Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump's media empire that he took public last week. 
where he was, you know, stood to make three billion dollars. It was valued at its peak around nine billion, then it dropped to seven. I mean, I don't quite understand how it, its valuation can shift so so significantly. There's a very good chance because the graph has pretty much been going down and down. There was a brief spike, down and down. Is that this ain't going to be worth shit by, by the end of the month? What's What's interesting is he's suing the people who created Trump Media. <laughs> You know, when, when Trump media was hired, they had startup money. Trump didn't put any of his own money in. You know, he had investors well, he never does. That, that put money in. Right, right. And and then he hired some tech guys to build out the, the true social page. All of those people are gone, as usual. Trump business partners get jettisoned, fired. So the people who created the website have all been fired. They're gone. And the some of the initial investors are gone. Uh, a couple of them are currently being they've just pled guilty yesterday to insider trading <laughs> so a couple surprise, of the initial surprise. investors and and he's suing his other business partners for making a bad deal because what they insisted on was two things number one knowing trump he can't cash out for six months because they justifiably recognize that the second it goes public, he was going to dump his stock and cash out and bail on this whole thing like he's done with every other business enterprise and screwed people over. So they made sure that he couldn't cash out for six months. So he's furious about that. He's also furious because they stipulated that he cannot go on to Twitter. He's got to stay on True Social. So this has his hands tied behind his back because he's running for president and he's got 82 million followers on Twitter, but he's not allowed to go on Twitter because of the, the deal that he negotiated with these guys. So it's a real mess. The stock has lost a third of its value in the last five days. By the time Trump is able to cash out, it may be worth next to nothing. It could be a penny stock, if anything. It could be. I mean, that's so interesting, isn't it? Because, it, again, it's a metaphor for who Donald Trump is, you know, creating this empire that is just made of nothing you know, it's just all branding and, and yep. really there's, there's nothing to it and then like a like a being popped like a balloon it just is shown for what it really is you know a, a, a lazy piece of latex lying on the floor with no air inside it it was quite the metaphor wasn't it <laughs> um okay let's talk about marjorie taylor green i know that uh, how much you you love these types of conversations um she's really got it in for mike johnson hasn't she in fact there there's talk that there might be a, a another revolt within the within the ranks let's take a look at her yes, ma'am <laughs> steve i'll tell you you know i was at the tire shop here in in my hometown of rome georgia today and people were asking me about it. They're outraged. Everywhere I go in my district, everyone is so angry at Mike Johnson. And one guy said it to me like this. He goes, do they have Mike Johnson's wife tied up somewhere and have a gun to her head? What is wrong with Mike Johnson? And everything you just explained, people can't even comprehend who he is and what he is doing. But I tell you, I'll put it to you like this. I think he's been promoted to be the senior partner at the firm. And you know what that means. Uh, he is not working for Republicans. He is not helping Republicans. He's not even listening to Republicans. Uh, he is doing the very dirty work of the deep state, and it happens fast and shocking. Let me let me let me give you guys. That's very interesting, isn't it? You know, referring to the Trump group as the firm, which is a kind of mafia reference, isn't it? No, he's ta she's talking about the deep state. She's saying that he's joined, the, he's become a senior partner with the firm. He's been bought off by the deep state. That's what she's saying. And so the you deep get, state. Yeah, learn the MAGA code. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The deep state is, of course, the U.S. government. So she's saying that he's effectively siding yeah. with, the, with 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 Joe Biden, who yeah, you know, and and Mitch right. McConnell and Chuck Schumer. That he's he's compromised. That he's he's sold his soul to the devil is basically what she's what she's the argument that she's make he's making. This is going to get really, really interesting next week. OK, and I'll tell you why, because she filed she filed the motion to vacate. Right. So the question but she didn't call it up for a vote. So the question, because if she calls it up for a vote, then that's when the rubber is going to meet the road here. But no one else has backed her to do that yet. So the question is, is she just doing this for publicity to get a bunch of interviews or is she serious? Well, the rubber's going to meet the road Monday because what Mike Johnson said going into the Easter break here 
was that his first priority when they return on Monday is Ukraine aid. Okay. Aid to Ukraine. And that the Republic, you know, the House Republicans are bitterly divided on that. Probably most of the House Republicans are opposed to it. A, a slight majority are probably opposed. Um, and so this is going to be an ugly battle. And he's come up with some BS reasons why he's changed his position on Ukraine aid, which is, oh, we're going to do it as a loan and we're going to get reimbursed by sanctioning by new Russia sanctions. And this is that. What all these things are just window dressing, a smokescreen. He's going to pass Ukraine aid. The Senate's going to pass it. And then we're going to really see what's going to happen. Are these Republicans going to then side with with Green and say, OK, time to oust this guy right before a huge election when they're trying to hold on to a razor thin majority or or not? Are they are they just going to yell and scream and do nothing? I mean, if, if there's any anything that's going to get. Mike Johnson toppled. It's going to be Ukraine. It, so what wasn't the budget thing? It's going to be Ukraine. It's interesting, isn't it? How we associate MAGA Mike Johnson with with Trump, and yet Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's like in this like splinter group, associates him with with Biden, and yet we associate Mitch McConnell with Trump, but actually he's like also, you talk about the establishment, he's also like in another direction. So it, it's not as simple as the the left and the right, is it? I mean, actually, no. there there's quite a few different tributaries and avenues where people politically sit and who they're prepared to listen to. It's a very good point because you, you hear them use the term uniparty a lot, and yeah. that's what they're referring to. The way they see it is there is no... MAGA, Republican establishment, Democratic establishment, and far left. In their view, those last three groups are all the same group, okay? They view people like Mitch McConnell, uh, Mitt Romney, you know, John Thune, these kinds of people as all part of essentially one big deep state uniparty where they're, they're all aligned. It's all about the military industrial complex, big business, corporate America, the media, all that kind of stuff. And that the only true patriots are the MAGA. So in other words, they, they, they don't view Mitch McConnell as being one of them whatsoever. The fact that they may be in the same political party means nothing to them. They don't even recognize them as real republicans it's also why they call them rhinos yeah. so it's the they always they they blend those terms together rhino deep state uniparty all the same they and and what she has said in, over the last two weeks is that mike johnson used to be one of us but he's sold out he's now with them but that you know has to happen by osmosis and and it happened with Kevin McCarthy as well. You know, the moment yep. you become the Speaker of the House and you're second in line to the presidency is that you have a responsibility to the country, not just to the, the Freedom Caucus. Well, what's even happened to the Freedom Caucus? Well, they don't view it that way. You know, <laughs> they don't. They, they thought when Mike Johnson got there, it was like one of us is now in charge. We're going to shut down the government. We're going to cut off foreign aid. You know, everything's going to come to a crashing halt. And. For a while there, it looked like Mike Johnson might actually do those things. Yeah. But something happened along the way. I mean, what they say is like the deep state got to him. What I think happened is the gravity of the of the office and, and the slim majority and the reality. I've listened to Mike Johnson interviews over the last two weeks a lot. And that's basically what he said is like, hey, I would love to do all the stuff that the Freedom Caucus MAGA people want to do. But we can't. We've got to be responsible. We've got to try and build our majority. And 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 the way that they want me to go will destroy our majority. And he's right about that. I mean, he's actually semi doing the responsible thing, not because he wants to do the right thing, but because that's the only way he sees to hang on to power. I mean, he's too dumb to come up with this stuff by himself. I think that this is where Joe Biden needs to get some credit. Because, you know, yes. I'm certain that there is communication between the White House and, and the, the office of Speaker to the point that, you know, they're pointing out to him what is at stake. And therefore he has to, whether he prays to Jesus or, you know, however he comes to these conclusions, but he does realize the, the magnitude of, of the role. When he goes in these leadership meetings, everyone's against him. Mitch McConnell is against him. You know, Hakeem Jeffries, the president, Schumer. 
you know, he sits in these meetings and there's not one soul in the room that is, is pulling him in the MAGA direction. <laughs> and so I think that that he did get worn down, but I think it's also a situation where he under, he understood. And he said this in interviews, if they shut down the government, he knew that they were going to be destroyed. And he, he mentioned this in interviews several times is that every single time in the past, Republicans have shut down the government. They got creamed in the next election. And he recognizes that. Um, let's talk about this uh, migrant uh, bus hoax that you posted about. That's a, a very interesting story. Just give us the backstory on this. I'll put the I'll put the tweet up on the screen, and you can explain it. <sighs> more mania. I mean, just more insanity and mania from these people. You know, they're obsessed with migrants. That's their whole thing, and they, you know, they're convinced that there's all these secret uh, trips and buses and everything of migrants being shuffled around. So what happens is the, you know, the March Madness NCAA basketball tournament is going on and the Gonzaga basketball team from the state of Washington arrives at the Detroit airport, board their buses to go to the game that they're playing in Detroit, in Michigan. And so this State representative in the state of Michigan sees these buses and tweet. These are secret migrant flights that all these migrants have been flown in by Biden to our state. We're being invaded. There's buses of migrants invading our state. And you see there, I chose that one because it was retweeted by the chairman of the Michigan Republican Party. The top guy in Michigan retweeted this hoax. It was a basketball team. And so this is where we're at. These people just have no proof, no evidence. We've seen this with accusations of the, the shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade up in uh, the border of Canada. One incident after another, one hoax after another that they blame on migrants with no proof, no evidence, only to turn out that it wasn't. And it just doesn't seem to be stopping them. They just keep they just keep creating these hoaxes. They never apologize, and they just move on to the next one. It's it's the faux outrage that for me is the theme with a lot of this you know, MAGA Republican uh, use of language. That 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 I mean, I just put a video a video out about to Rona McDaniel where I I completely broke down everything that she said in that, that interview with NBC. And, and I, I said at one point, I wish her face matched her voice. You know, she says things, but her face doesn't look like she's, re she really, she's really bothered. And, and just saying the right thing or saying what you think people want to hear is all very well a couple of times. But when you are on camera a lot or when you are giving interviews a lot or when you are in the public eye... You need to maintain some kind of consistency with your opinion and have some passion for it. And that's what I'm also, you know, we're talking about what contributes towards the Republican vote fa fading over time. It's these disingenuous events and the way that people communicate about them. Yeah, I mean, when you just continue to cry hoax and uh, cry wolf and, and create hoaxes one right after the other, eventually people start to tune you out except for your hardcore nut jobs. Yeah. But you know, the average voter, are they going to listen to these people after they're constantly posting hoaxes and fake stuff? And you know, even their own supporters are retweeting these things and spreading around. And then they're looking like idiots when they turn out to not be true. Um, you know, it, it's not going to slow down the hardcore crazies, but you know, hopefully the average people are going to get tired of this nonsense Democrats are not doing this stuff. You know, we're not we're not constantly putting out fake hoaxes day after day with no proof, no evidence. And not only that, it's not just nuts on the internet. It's Fox News, it's Newsmax. This is this stuff is mainstreamed on the right. It's also the disgraced former president. And and yeah. that that really, you know, when if he leads, then people will follow. And so, you know, he's always been the kind of guy that where his ego is such that if he if he squints, it goes away. And that's what he tried to do with COVID. You know, it's like, you know, let's not test people and then there won't be so many. And it's like, are you aware of the consequences of not testing people? You do realize you're going to kill half the country. But in his mind, the ego is such that by not testing, you're not going to get as many 
numbers and then the graph isn't going to look as big. And he's like, there you go. I sorted it out. I mean, it is not just the dumbest position to take, lacking in any kind of intelligence whatsoever. But it is so, you know, he thinks of himself with this messiah complex. And, and that's where a lot of this stems from, isn't it? It's like it's his way or the highway. And if he closes his eyes, then, you know, nuclear war is over and it's, it's celebrating, you know, Trump International Day. We see that how he's handling all of his court cases. Yeah, he's in, totally in denial. He 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 doesn't. We saw that with the bond thing. You know, he we talked about. He had three months to prepare to post a bond to get ready, but he was in denial. He even though it was obvious to everyone he was going to lose and get hit with a big fine, he just never believed that it was going to happen until it happened. And look, this guy has a criminal trial starting in twelve days. Criminal trial where he literally could be going to jail in a few weeks, in, in a couple of months when, and, and by the way, this is a criminal trial where he has to be in the courtroom every single day, all day. It's not civil where he can pop in and out. He's got to be there for this. And he literally could be going to jail in, in May. And, and yet he doesn't even think that this is a, a realm of possibility because what is he doing? He's attacking day after day the judge who's going to decide whether he goes to jail or not. This is not anything that a sane, rational person does. If if there's one person out there that is going to decide whether you get probation or prison and you're going to attack that person every single day, only yeah. a madman would do that. And their daughter, which is probably worse. Yeah. Um, Still, you know, I, I listened to uh, the news on NPR, and again, they're just covering this election like a standard two-horse race. No mention of, of his mental health, no mention of his authoritarianism or and nothing. It's just, it's so frustrating to me, you know, as a, as a traditional newsman, you know, that's my background, coming to this and hearing a country with with, you know, a dictatorship knocking on the door and just covering it like it's a normal election. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, we, 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 this country is so young. You know, I think people forget that. This country is so young. It hasn't had the opportunity to evolve over thousands of years like other countries that have seen coups and the, the rise and fall of, of dictatorships and, and, and you know, vari various political historical events, which you know only full too well with your background in, in teaching history. And, and it, you know, I think about some of the young people working in newsrooms, especially in national public radio, and they just have no idea what's going on here, like no idea. And if you compare Trump to Hitler or any of the dictators in history or even the existing ones in, in, in you know, which we talk about all the time, they cannot make the correlation because he's come from reality television. It just makes him like a kind of jovial, like a novelty character. Yeah, I mean, you, you could definitely fall. I, I cover all these guys, and and there is a circus clown element to a lot of these people, you know, whether it's George Santos or Carrie Lake or, or any Herschel Walker. But it's Walker. deadly serious. But it's it is. deadly That's serious. Thing. But you can you can ca you catch sometimes you fall into the trap of laughing at these people and treating them as a joke, but but like you said, you can't because no. their intent is very bad. Okay, we have one minute left, so let's uh, talk finally about um, the 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 networks and how they're kind of starting to report on this stuff. Let me play yeah. this clip from CNN. I mean, debates bring up this issue. I, there was a report that the White House wants more people to see Trump rallies, the whole thing, because they're so wild and in some cases unhinged. The, maybe they're having the opposite problems, that people are not hearing Trump quite enough. Do you think that they want debates with Trump to really put that center stage? Yeah. I mean, I think you're definitely right that Biden benefits from having Trump as his, I mean, as his opponent and as his foil, you know, to say there are plenty of Democratic voters who are not enthusiastic about Biden. We know that. But I think more so there are Democratic voters who are terrified of Trump. So the more they can play up that contrast is going to be incredibly beneficial to them. So, yeah, I think a debate could be something that they're they're looking forward to. I mean, you know, that is a little progress, but there is no urgency in that debate, Ron. No urgency, no fear of, of, of authoritarianism, no fear of the collapse of America and, and that knock-on effect. You know, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold, famously. I think here's what's going on. In 2016, the media 
ran his rallies, you know, covered them f cover to cover, had Trump on all the time. Trump was on Morning Joe all the time. Trump was on CNN all the time. Too much. OK. Yeah. And they treated him as like a show, a, a, you know, a, a, a reality show. His campaign is a reality show. And the postmortem from from that, from the media was we screwed up. We, we 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 messed up. We don't we shouldn't do that again. And so in 20, they overcorrected and they ignored his mania, his craziness. And they thought the best thing to do is ignore him. And through all throughout 2020 and 2021 and even a little bit into 2022, I was saying this is a massive mistake. You what you have to do is you have to have that middle ground. You don't cover him cover to cover. You don't show his, all of his speeches. You don't show all of his press conferences, but you don't ignore the crazy. You do have to come in and pull out the crazy and show that to people. So we went from covering him too much to not covering him at all. But now I think the White House understands. I mean, I'm not saying they're just getting it from me, but what I've been saying for the last four years, which is, what you have to show the American people how insane and crazy he's become. Don't cover all of it, but you got to cover the crazy. That's what I've done. That's what Midas has done. And I think the, the Biden campaign totally gets it now. They bought into this philosophy and now they're trying to get the media to get it. Yeah, there's, there's so much. And, and But my point about urgency is also important. He's talking about internment camps, like talk about Project 2025 yeah. on the news all the time, like dismantle it, bring experts in to talk about, you know, Christian nationalism and what it means for a secular people. There's so much to say on this subject. And they're like, oh, should he do TV debates? I mean, like, who cares? You know, that's, that's how I feel anyway. Listen, we have to finish, but I, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you, as always. Uh, if you want to download the audio podcast, it'll be available tonight, so you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. I should remind you to watch Against All Enemies. It's the new Midas Touch produced documentary, which talks about January 6th and the, and the far right, and is absolutely fascinating. So give that a go. I think you can get that on, uh, where did I get it? Apple TV. That's right. Not Apple TV Plus, Apple TV. You don't need to subscribe. You can get it from there. So that's against all enemies. Ron, thanks a lot. See you next week. You got it.